Hello, I'm Liz Thompson, an Associate Editor at Immunity, and I'm at the 78th um, Cold Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. The topic of this meeting is immunity intolerance, and today I'm talking to Rafi Ahmed from the Emory Vaccine Centre at the Emory School of Medicine. Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, so your work focuses on trying to understand how T cells generate memory to pathogens and how T cells responses fail um, in certain types of viral infections and cancer. Um, so to begin, perhaps you can tell us a bit about why T cell memory is so important. Yes, um, T cell memory is very critical because um, after infection, after infection is cleared, when you get re-exposure to, uh, to the same pathogen, uh, there, are two, there are two levels of uh, protection at that stage. One is the antibody that you have made, pre-existing antibody. But most viruses are not fully neutralized by that antibody that's there. So some cells always get infected. Uh, so it's a very critical, uh, it's a second layer of protection, but a very critical layer of protection. So people who have deficiencies in T cells are always getting viral infections over and over again. Uh, so for most intracellular pathogens, viruses, bac uh, intracellular bacteria, many uh, parasitic infections which are intracellular, uh, and for cancers also, the T cell immunity is very critical. Okay, but in some types of um, vi well, some types of infections, and also in cancers, and um, the T cells fail to clear the antigen, and then yeah. they can become exhausted. So yes, what, right, what does right. that so involve? This, yeah, so we're actually very pleased with the how our work has evolved over the years, uh, looking at uh, T cell immunity and kind of a well-defined animal model, uh, uh, but which has really had a lot of implications in terms of also translational implications of treatment. So we uh, started asking the question, what happens to T cell fate and T cell development uh, <coughs> when you have an acute infection versus what when you have a chronic, uh, chronic infection? And what we showed about 15 years back is that if you have an acute infection, then you're left with this pool of highly functional memory cells, which can provide protection, uh, in some cases, lifelong protection against uh, reinfections. Um, uh, but if you have a chronic infection, um, then those T cells become uh, dysfunctional, and, and, and they don't develop in the most optimal way. Uh, and so the question was, you know, what is the potential mechanism for this uh, dysfunction? Yep. And, um, and then the more important question was, can you, can you do something to make these cells functional again? And so here is where we started getting into these uh, inhibitory receptors that are expressed by T cells. So they're like brakes on the T cell. Uh, and the one uh, that we've uh, identified as an important regulator is called PD-1. And, um, and this uh, really functions as a brake on the T cell. So it tells the T cell don't function well. Yep. And if you can release this brake, uh, then the T cells become more functional. And the way we release this break is by um, using antibodies that will block that inhibitory receptor. Okay. The T cells become more functional. And the nice part uh, uh, is that even though our studies were very fundamental, we were using uh, mouse models, using a chronic infection and acute infection model, but this discovery that PD-1 is an important regulator, first that the T cells get exhausted in chronic infection came from these findings. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, and then these findings were extended to many human viral infections. So it's a nice example of where you do fundamental basic work in a animal model, and then that kind of translates very nicely into humans. So it was shown that in people who are infected with HIV, or infected with hepatitis B virus, or hepatitis C virus, uh, you get similar level of uh, T cell exhaustion. And then the discovery that PD-1 is a important regulator of their function was also extended. Yeah. And um, and and now uh, there are some very promising cl uh, clinical trials, uh, okay. especially in cancers. I think it's kind of a nice feeling that you do something very fundamental. Not and at that time we really were not even thinking of any uh, applications. Yeah. Uh, we were trying to understand how T cells differentiate and how they function if it's the acute versus chronic infection. And from there, we learned about exhaustion that was uh, applied to human uh, infections and cancer. And then we were studying this inhibitory receptor, and that is now translating into something in the clinic uh, and having promising early, early promising results with the cancer patients. Okay, can you tell right. us a bit more about those clinical data? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> clinical data, there have been, uh, there are several uh, pharma now, big pharma that are uh, working on these. And um, the Bristol Myers Squibb is uh, involved in this in a very significant way. 
uh, Merck is involved in it, and Genentech, and there are also some smaller ones. But these are the three large ph pharmaceutical companies which are moving this, uh, this therapy forward. Uh, so the first study that was published uh, was uh, two phase one clinical trials by Bristol Myers Squibb. And they used it um, in, <coughs> in these studies about 250, in each of these studies, about 250 patients that were late stage cancer patients. Uh, that had failed other therapies, so it was very late stage uh, um, cancers. They were treated with uh, antibody that blocked the inhibitory receptor. And the results were quite promising. Uh, it was only a single therapy, the monotherapy, it yeah. was not in combination with any uh, drug or radiation or anything, it was just straight uh, uh, blockade, uh, blockade therapy. And um, the results uh, ranged from anywhere between 10 to 15 percent efficacy rates to up to 25, 30 percent, depending on the cancer. Uh, and the, the, this really uh, brought great excitement yeah. into, the, uh, into the field that a single monotherapy could have these effects. And one of the most uh, promising results from those uh, two papers from the Bristol Myers Squibb was uh, that there was also efficacy seen for uh, small cell lung carcinoma, which is a very difficult uh, tumor to treat. And uh, so in terms of immunotherapy, uh, the earlier work that had been done was CTLA-4 blocking. Yep. And then uh, these early stage data, but very promising data with the PD-1 are really kind of transforming uh, how people are thinking about treating, uh, treating cancer. Yep. And then um, just actually yesterday, <laughs> yesterday two more papers came out. Uh, one is another paper by uh, Bristol Myers Squibb where they combined the CTLA-4 blockade mm -hmm. uh, and the PD-1 blockade. And now they're getting up to 50% efficacy rate. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's quite, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite I mean, it's too hard, it's hard, it's too good to be true, as some people <laughs> are saying, whether this will hold up as, uh, as this moves forward. Because at this stage, it's phase one. With yep. it, and the number of patients are like 200 in one study and 130 in another study. But uh, it's still very striking result. And then the other paper that came out yesterday, both of these are also in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, is a monotherapy by uh, the anti-PD-1 that Merck has developed. And this uh, has shown the, the most promising data. And they treated 135 uh, melanoma patients with their anti-PD-1 antibody, and they saw almost 40 to 50 percent response rates. With the single monoclonal. With the single monoclonal. It's really uh, almost unbelievable data. Yep. And uh, and in about seven of them, they saw almost complete responses. Um, and the durability is at least out to 11 months. So there's so really pretty long durability too, yeah. S uh, and based on this, um, on, on this phase one trial, uh, their anti-PD-1 antibody has been designated as a breakthrough drug. So are you familiar with this no. breakthrough drug? Yeah, <laughs> so what uh, happens, the FDA, which is the one that will approve all drugs. Yeah. Uh, the FDA uh, keeps an eye on phase one clinical trials that are being done for anything. Could be yep. cancer, could be autoimmunity, could be heart disease. Uh, they're keeping track of drugs. Uh, so if there's some drug that they feel is very promising and could save a lot of lives, they give it this breakthrough uh, drug designation. And they only give this for maybe a handful every year maybe four to five each year, it's not that many. And what this does is that if, if it's designated a breakthrough drug by the FDA, basically it's a fast track to licensure. So, so Merck will not have to do a phase three. Okay. Yeah. So Merck can uh, do a phase two trial, perhaps with uh, 1,000 people or 500 people, I don't know the exact number. Yep. Okay. Uh, but, and if that uh, results are also promising, then they have a very easy path to licensure. They would not have to do a phase three. Yeah. Okay, um, actually, and so back to the mechanistic yeah. aspect of yeah. PD-1, so you've yeah. mentioned how on the exhausted T cells, it's yeah. important to maintain that functional yeah. state. Yeah. Um, is anything know about known about any other effects it might have? Yeah, so the that's response? the talk I gave <laughs> yeah. today, which yeah. is kind of a, uh, which was something that uh, we had known but not fully appreciated, yeah. that uh, this uh, inhibitory receptor uh, is also uh, expressed during the early phase of T cell activation. And there it has a different role. It, the role there is not to exhaust the immune response or make it dysfunctional, but it's to really regulate uh, the intensity of uh, T cell receptor signaling. 
so that you get long-lived memory cells. So really, yeah. it's a very interesting molecule, which is playing a role in uh, giving us the right balance of effector cells and memory cells, so you have long-term memory. Uh, and then when the uh, cells are overstimulated, it really is putting a break on it. And, and interestingly, even though it's a break on it, and is making this function, it's keeping the cells alive. Okay. So there's a very interesting uh, molecule in terms of the different uh, way it's kind of regulating uh, T-cell function. Yeah. So for your, for your research, what do you think, what's one of the most important questions that you want to focus on over well the Well, what we years? want to focus now on is how can we really make an exhausted cell a truly functional long-lived memory cell? So we've identified one mechanism by relieving, uh, releasing this break where you make the cells more functional. But my f uh, prediction is that's going to be transient because we're not changing the epigenetics of the cell. Yeah. We're making it functional for, hopefully for several weeks or several months, okay? Uh, but if you really want it to become like a long-lived memory cell, I think we would have to also go in and, and reprogram the cell. So our big goal, this will not be easy, <laughs> uh, but our big goal for the next whatever years, and I think also for the field it will be, is to kind of combine, uh, combine things like this blockade strategies with some epigenetic uh, effect, so we can reprogram the cell too. Yeah. So then not only do we release the break and get it to be functional at that time, but we can also actually then really make it truly a long-lived memory cell in terms of its epigenetics. So I think that that really, to me, that's the next the big next thing, next big, big thing for the whole field. Not just for my lab, but I think for the whole field. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you yes. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.